Okay. So, the presentation tonight is called Online Video. It's not as scary as you think. Move this away so it doesn't wake me up. Okay. So, introduction. My name is Ben Hughes. Uh, online, I'm known as obviously Ben Hughes. Kind of easy to remember, I hope. Um, I've been a video blogger for three years. Uh, I've uploaded on multiple channels uh, on YouTube.com. I've uploaded over 700 videos and have been viewed over half a million times, which is kind of mind boggling. Um, I am an advertising student at the Savannah College of Art and Design in Savannah, Georgia, which is a beautiful place. If you ever get to visit, you really should. It's awesome. Um, I am a self admitted social media addict um, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, uh, even MySpace, which is a little bit dead. I still use it. Wow, that can pick me up from really far away. Um, and my favorite color, as you can see on my uh, my avatar, that is everywhere that I am on the internet, is green. Love green, favorite color. So here's the agenda. We're going to uh, go through all these topics one by one. Simple enough. First one is called cogitate this. If you don't know what cogitate means, it means to deeply mull over or think. It's one of my favorite words. Um, and it's some things that you should be thinking about as we go through the presentation. Um, it's some mind-boggling statistics, and you could be part of these statistics if you get into online video. Um, get equipped, obviously, is getting your equipment, what equipment you'll need to start creating effective videos and uh, be putting them online and not look like you know what you're doing. Um, editing, simple enough. Editing um, on both platforms. How many people are um, PC? Okay, how many people are Mac? Everyone else? I would assume so. Um, so I will go over um, beginner, mid-range, and kind of prosumer level um, uh, video editing techniques on, uh, on all three of those levels for both platforms. Um, blogging versus blogging. You guys are a WordPress group. You probably have been familiar with blogging. You may not be as familiar with blogging, which is my specialty. Um, audience, quality or quantity? Um, talking about uh, numbers of people versus the quality of interaction that you have with smaller numbers of people. Um, investing time, you will definitely need to be investing time if you want to be an effective video creator on the internet. Um, it's, it's something that you can do with as little time as you have. Um, if you want to, you can you know, shoot a video from a phone that might be able to upload directly to YouTube or you can create you know, insanely high quality productions and, uh, and put them online. And then lastly is platforms including um, YouTube, uh, self-hosting, WordPress, et cetera. So uh, keep in mind that online video really is a medium for every single person. There's no person in here who can say that they don't have some way to get into online video. Um, you've all probably seen a video on YouTube, I would assume. Yes? Yes. Good. That's a good thing, um, I would hope. Um, and you have a voice. Um, you all probably have different topics that you're interested in. Um, one of you might be interested in different ways to use tuna to make sandwiches. Um, you have a voice, you have a niche, you have an audience out there somewhere on the internet who will want to listen to how you make tuna sandwiches or how you love to play your banjo in your bathroom or you know anything that you might like to do, there's other people out there who will like to do that too. So cogitate over these facts, just about YouTube alone. Two billion, with a V, video views are created each day. On all of the videos on YouTube, they are viewed over two billion times in every single day. A full day, 24 hours of footage, is uploaded to YouTube in every single minute across the globe, no matter what time of day or night, anywhere that they are. 24 hours and every minute is uploaded. It is the number two search engine behind Google, which is also its parent company, and the number three worldwide website, according to Alexa uh, statistics. So, getting equipped. Um, what you see here is a flip camera. I don't know if any of you have ever used a flip camera, um, but that is the sort of lower end of uh, what you might want to use if you want to get quickly into making videos. Um, it's uh, also comparable to a point-and-shoot camera, or um, like my cell phone, it shoots um, very low-quality HD video. Um, a point-and-shoot camera or a flip camera, cheap, very effective, very quick. Um, you can literally handhold the thing, point it at yourself, make videos of yourself talking, and it has this cool little button that when you push it, a USB cord or a USB uh, jack pops out from the side. 
can pop it right into your computer, and you can either upload it directly from there, or you can drag it on your computer. If you want to edit it, you want to mix it around a little bit. Um, higher end, if you have anyone, um, has anyone ever bought like a Canon or a Nikon camera? Um, maybe it has shot um, HD video, maybe not. Um, that would be the higher end kind of stuff. Harder to handheld, handhold, um, it takes a little bit more effort to achieve a final product because you, um, if you are doing a video blog, you're going to need a tripod and you're going to need a connector on the bottom of that camera. Um, but you do get better quality. Higher price, better quality. Um, you'll get stunning images and videos from those cameras. Um, and you, like I said, it will take more effort to achieve a final product than if you were just using a point and shoot or a flip cam. Um, because you, instead of being able to upload directly to YouTube or to Viddler or your own site, which you can do, um, you might want to instead, because it's such a high quality video, um, import it and then edit it and make it look really, really nice. And, uh, and if you're going to have that level of quality, you do want it to look nice. And, uh, and then upload it. Alright, so for audio, a lot of people, including myself, um, usually just use the audio mic that is uh, included on whatever camera that you're using. Um, it's kind of a good idea, kind of a bad idea. Um, it's lower quality, which means that you're going to possibly have a hard time hearing um, whatever is being said. Um, I know that uh, anytime I've done that, I've at least gotten one comment on uh, every video that I've done that on saying, turn up your mic volume, um, which I can't. Um, but the, uh, the advantage for that is that it's pretty synced with the video. So if you ever um, maybe watched an action movie and you see them, and then you hear what they said, and it's not synced. Um, that's the kind of thing um, that you don't want to have um, happening with your video camera. So if you get, you know, using the built-in microphone, it'll be 99.99% of the time synced up with the way that your mouth is moving. Um, other ways that you can get audio is an external microphone, uh, better quality, <laughs> just like if you were using a prosumer camera, better quality, higher price, but you may in, uh, in post-production when you're editing, po in post, is another way to say when you're editing. Um, you may have to uh, sync up the audio. It might you know, be completely synced with whatever camera you're using, but it depends on your camera. If you guys have any questions during any of this, feel free to raise your hand. I will gladly stop and uh, answer anything. Yeah? How would you resync it in You would, the way that you would do that would be to bring your video file off of the camera, and then it will have a separate audio file also stored on the camera in probably a different folder. Um, you'll have to bring that and the video file into your uh, editing program, and then you're just going to have to sync up the noise with the way that your lips move. Um, hopefully, um, that's, that's a lot of the reason that sometimes there's a, um, a clap in the beginning of when they're making a film because they want to sync up the audio. Do you have a question? I was going to mention the clock, too. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a good one. All right, so editing on PCs. You guys who are PCs, um, you've probably seen a Windows Movie Maker video. If you don't know it, you probably have seen one. Um, Windows Movie Maker has been on so many different shipments of Windows platform uh, on, on computers all around the world. Um, it's simple. It gets the job done. Um, and there is an equivalent on Mac, which I will talk about. Um, it gets the job done, and it's good enough for beginners, um, but it's uh, it's really, you know, if you want to cut and splice your video clips and upload them, that's great, but if you want to do more advanced effects, or you want to um, maybe do, you know, crossfades between clips, um, then Windows Movie Maker could do it, but not at the level that might look professional. Um, and, of course, we want to look as professional as possible. Um, Sony Vegas is kind of like a mid-range um, editing program. You could get very involved with Vegas. I have friends who, you know, do green screening and, you know, do everything in Sony Vegas on their PCs, and it can get as involved or as simple as you really want it to be. Um, and then Adobe Premiere Pro, it's from Adobe. It comes either as its own program, I believe you can get it as its own program, or um, you can get it with the Creative Suite. Currently, Creative Suite 5 is, uh, is the newest Creative Suite from Adobe. Um, if you get it as part of the Creative Suite, you also get After Effects. And when you use those two programs together, I don't even know how to explain it. It's like, it's like one massive, amazing program. Um, and it's, it's really something that you have to use to understand, but it's, um, it's a way that you can have these two programs open. And usually when you have two programs open, they don't communicate with each other. 
Um, you can go into After Effects and you know create explosions and fire and lightning bolts and all this stuff. And all you have to do, literally, is once you're finished, click on that scene, drag it over into Premiere, and it's all there. And it's you know it's mind blowing how simple it is. Um, so that's that's a really really good way to get into the more high level prosumer editing effects um, with something that's still easy to use and has a great UI. UI is user interface. If you don't know. Um, so Max, you have probably heard of iMovie. Um, it is kind of a step above Windows Movie Maker, but it's like on the same level. Um, it's for beginning movies, um, beginning short films, clips, things that you shoot with your friends. Um, it, like I said, gets the job done. Simple for beginners, but it's not the best that you could do. Um, it does create very professional looking stuff. Um, I have friends who are very, very successful in online video, and they still use the iSight camera on their, uh, on their MacBook Pro, and they use iMovie, which is just mind blowing, but they, uh, you know, they make a living from it now. Um, Adobe Premiere Pro, like I said, if you get Premiere and you have After Effects, or even just Premiere, um, there's so many things that you can do, and it's a, uh, a great way that you can get into some of the mid-range to higher level stuff without going absolutely bonkers crazy. Yeah. I just wanted to mention that Photoshop also integrates with those two programs. And that's true. If you, a lot of the Creative Suite programs, um, like Photoshop, if you were to create an image in Photoshop and you wanted to, instead of you know exporting the entire thing, um, if you created an image in Photoshop and you wanted it in your video, you could drag it over from Photoshop right into that program, probably without saving, I'm pretty sure. Um, or you might have to save at least once. Yeah, but it's it's still, it's so much simpler than you know exporting to this program and importing in another format and then exporting in another format. It's, it's keep it super simple, that's what it is. Um, and then Final Cut Pro, very advanced. Um, there's a lot of professional consumers who use this and, uh, and it can do amazing things. Um, it really is a sight to behold, um, but it's something that as a beginner you probably will not want to set hands on um, because I looked at it once and I was very intimidated um, and it, it just scared the living daylights out of me. Um, I eventually will get to that, but I want to get more comfortable with uh, the programs that I use now. Yes? Is there a equivalent of the quality of Um, you can get the same quality most likely from Adobe Premiere Pro. Um, I, I just wanted to show um, that Premiere is usually the farthest that you can go on a PC, and with a Mac you can go just that extra bit farther. Um, I'm sorry? Avid. It's, um, Avid is one of those things that a lot of people use, and you can get crazy good stuff. Um, there's professional movies that are created on Avid editing systems. Um, and the school that I go to has Avid editing bays, and uh, and a lot of the time you need to get an entire system along with the Avid program, um, because Avid just takes so much power to render all those videos. It's definitely something that you wouldn't be running on your home PC, most likely, um, unless you definitely upgraded everything. Yeah? Camtasia? Camtasia, I've heard of it, and I've used it maybe a year and a half ago. Um, I personally didn't enjoy it. Um, I mean, it, it probably is a lot cheaper compared to some of these things, um, but I, you know, it's, it isn't going to be the most professional that you could get. Any other questions? Okay. So, for file formats, I know that um, Jay wanted to know about file formats and stuff. Um, there's standard definition and high definition, HD. You've heard of HD TVs. Um, standard definition is usually, you'll see it in a square, um, or if it's in a rectangular, more rectangular box, then it's going to be less high quality than high definition, just naturally. Um, it's a smaller file type, it's a quicker upload to the internet, and it will probably be a faster load if you're self-hosting and, uh, and will use less bandwidth. Um, but you also will notice a lot of things like, uh, if you've ever watched an old VHS tape and you've seen a person moving and they have a kind of ghost trail behind them, that's kind of an effect that you would see with standard definition a lot of the time. Um, high definition, large files, very large files can go as big as you want, um, but uh, they also have a very, very crisp picture. There's so many websites now that uh, support high definition video. Um, Vimeo was one of the first. Now YouTube um, announced in July that they're upping their uh, high definition limit from 1080p, which is known around the world as true high definition, they're now upping uh, their file sizes to include 
four pay, which is like four times bigger than 1080p. Um, and you would be able to stream that right onto your computer, um, assuming that you had the internet connection and not three hours to waste um, just letting it live. Um, but that is that is available to you if you have a $200,000 red camera and you want to shoot in 4K, you can upload it. Excuse me, Ben. Yeah. Uh, individual besides cost, who would pay high definition versus the standard? It's slow cost and mm -hmm. the picture quality is not that horrible. Well, I mean, with flip video cameras, 720p is what they're recording. Um, that is lower high definition. Um, it's not standard definition, so it's not you know VHS quality or anything like that. Um, but I mean, you can get a flip video camera for $149, and it will shoot the lower quality high definition. Um, so I mean, it really, it really could be anyone. I just wanted to let you know what a lot of you may have been used to with, you know, a VHS tape or with, um, you know, watching TV before you get an HD TV. That's what you're usually seeing. It's not very crisp. And then um, if you like, I upload almost every single video that I upload is uh, is now in 720p, and just because it's it's what my camera shoots. Um, I mean, my my cell phone shoots 720p, so it's not going to be a very long time until you all have access to that. So you don't shoot with a flip? You use your... I used to shoot with a flip, um, and I had a lot of problems with it. It um, ended up breaking. Um, that's just a personal thing. It's not like I hate the company or anything, um, but it's it just wasn't working for me. Literally, it was not working. Um, and then I got my phone, and I was like, um, the screen actually went completely white. Uh, which kind of stinks, but um, I mean that's just something that was unavoidable, and uh, it was out of warranty, so we couldn't return it. Um, but like I said, I got my phone, and that shot you know the same exact definition as uh, as the flip. So is that an iPhone? No, this is a uh, Verizon Droid X, um, and it's it's my baby. <laughs> um, but it yeah it it definitely is uh, is helping shoot on the go stuff and shoot uh, videos. You know, in places that I might need to be more discreet, like going to concerts, you can take the phone instead of, you know, getting searched and having them take your camera away or whatever. Even in low lighting, you find that it's a pretty good quality Yeah, video. yeah. Um, if you want to afterward, I can show you. Um, I went to a concert about a week ago, and I shot some low light, um, low light videos, and it was, you know, yeah, crisp and clear. Yeah, so. Is there any difference in quality in the camera that you use to have Android? Um, there is. I mean, Android has an 8 megapixel camera with HD video um, on, on the Droid X, um, not on all Android phones. But um, the 720p video that came from the Flip was, to my eyes noticeably, a little bit crisper. Um, but to someone who's watching online, um, who's watching it at 360p, they're probably not going to, going to notice unless they you know, compare them side by side. So, yeah. I might have a comment, Okay which have higher definition and uh, removable mic and all kinds of mm -hmm. other things. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of different um, alternatives that you can look at. Um, there's cameras, you know, that you can, like I said, Flip Video does 720p video for anywhere from $149 to $279. And that's really, really good for, you know, anything that you might want to shoot your kids in the pool. Not, not shoot your kids in the pool. Um, <laughs> get video of your kids in the pool. Um, if you wanted to get video of, you know, going out mini golfing or anything like that. Um, if you wanted to do higher production quality stuff, you could go, you know, into the thousands of dollars and get a, you know, Canon AOS 500D or get a Lumix GH1, which is a camera that I'm really, really intent on getting because um, it's beautiful and it shoots 1080 PhD. Um, anything else? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, File formats, um, there's a lot of different things that you need to know about file formats that I won't go into. Um, the file formats that I'm going to show you now are ones that I've personally been using um, and have been told by numerous people um, repeatedly that these are the things that I should be using. Um, for video, there's a, an encoding method called H.264. Um, that is a very small compressed file size, but it still gives a very crisp image. Um, and it's now become a universal standard. Um, and it is open source, meaning that anyone can take that standard and build off of it and create you know, even better quality videos. And, uh, and they could you know, potentially use that to make the next big you know, video quality. Um, and that is what a lot of uh, video cameras will natively shoot now. 
um, natively, meaning like right out of the box they will shoot H.264. Um, YouTube is actually going to entire H.264 uploads. Um, so if you upload to YouTube with that uh, file type, it will be generally faster. Um, if you were to upload like an MOV file, a movie file, um, which is QuickTime based, you would upload it generally faster than you would if you were to upload, you know, something like an M4V. These are you know, technical terms and file types, but it's it's things that you probably should know. Um, AAC for audio is a royalty-free audio codec. So what that means is that the people who developed it are saying, you know what, we developed this, this is really cool. We want to share it with other people, but you know, we don't need the money for it. So here you go, have this community, and uh, and you can use this as you want. The reason, <coughs> excuse me, the reason that AAC is becoming so prevalent is because Apple has now begun using AAC with iTunes. Um, every time that you pop a disc into your computer and you use iTunes to download those songs onto your computer, they download in AAC. You can choose in your settings to download with MP3, but usually they download with AAC. Um, the reason for that is that AAC is the successor, the next version of MP3. So it goes, um, it went MP1, 2, 3, which is the most common that we know, and then MP4. This is MP4, in other words. Um, and it's a smaller file size with the same amount of quality, so if you're uploading a video and you really want to get it up quickly, you would use AAC. It has the exact same um, bitrate qualities, you can get it up as fast as you need to um, because it's a smaller file size. And uh, the reason that Apple and iTunes are now using that is because it fits on an iPod a lot more songs. Okay, so this is the screen that I have. Oh yeah, sorry. Quick question about the file formats. Do yeah. we need to be concerned about what is on the computer of people that are viewing these videos, or is this so universal that we don't need to worry about that? It's kind of both. Um, if you're, um, what would you be planning on using? Would you be uploading to your own web server or to YouTube or, um, you know, uploading uh, directly to a server for iTunes distribution? Um, it, it depends on that. Um, Usually if you upload it to YouTube, they will put it into a flash video form and then save the H.264 version for you know viewing on an iPad or an iPhone or you know mobile viewing. Um, they kind of take care of everything that you might need to worry about um, on their end, which is you know really fantastic. Um, if you're self-hosting, you might need to be concerned about it. Usually if they have iTunes on their computer, they can play it. Who else? Um, like I said, this is my export screen that I took a screenshot of just today in Premiere Pro. Um, there's a preset that I made called Ben Normal Preset that if I want, you know, just export the video exactly how I want it, I go there and I click that preset. It's really easy to make a preset in, um, in Adobe Premiere Pro. There's tutorials online that you could find out about that. Um, for video, I use NTSC. There's two versions that you can use, NTSC encoding or PAL encoding. Um, I've honestly not invested a lot of time learning about those, but I've always been told that NTSC is the easiest to upload and view universally. Yeah. How's the uh, European standard? Oh, okay, so that's NTSC is probably what we use over here. Okay. Um, the uh, next set of numbers, 1280 by 720, that's just the dimensions of the video. Um, that's standard 720p. Um, 29.97 FPS, that's the frames per second. Um, usually, if you're watching a video uh, online, it'll be either in 24, well, 23.096, or in 29.97 uh, frames per second. Um, oh. um, so if you're watching a video online, um, a lot of the time it's in 29.97 um, frames per second. Oh wow, that picks up so well. Um, and if you're watching a movie, like an actual movie on the big screen, it'll be in 24 frames per second. That's just a general rounding. It's like 23.096. Um, and then progressive, when you export as progressive, it will be exporting so that when you play it on your computer, when you're streaming it to you know other people's computers from your web server, have you ever watched a video online and maybe your internet connection isn't fast enough that it streams the entire video? So you might be talking and then the person just freezes and you've got to wait for it to load, and wait for it to load, and then it keeps going. Progressive means that when you export it, it's going to load the rest of the video file before you get to it, so you have a seamless viewing experience, which is really cool.
um, audio, like I said, AAC is what I use. Um, 64 kbps is just how fast the audio um, gets to you in that size. Um, 48 kilohertz, or I can never remember if it's kilohertz or kilohertz. Um, but I've, that's another one, just like um, NTSC, that I've always just been told um, that's what I should be using. Some people recommend going at 192 kilobytes per second. Um, it's, it's really, I mean, there's different ways to approach it. I've got friends who um, import all of their music to iTunes at the very highest setting because they want to hear every little snare drum beat and everything. Um, for my purposes for streaming on YouTube, it's Kinda not, yeah. I mean, it's it's usually just my voice, um, so it's you know as long as people can understand what's coming out of my mouth, I'm usually pretty set on that. So if it's multi-track, you want to go higher kilobytes per second. If you want to Most likely, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, just a couple options I would suggest. Okay. Um, you make it mono. You don't gain anything in stereo, and actually a smaller file. Okay. When you set it to mono, and um, Okay. So two pass, you get better quality. It takes longer on the um, conversion, but it doesn't cost anybody on the playback. Mm -hmm. So if you take the time to, to produce something that is better quality, it doesn't, it looks better. That you do it. Usually, um, if it if it were like a school project, um, I probably would use a professor's knowledge of that and you know say what is the best thing that I can export. Um, like I said, I, I usually export for YouTube, um, and it's not for um, downloaded viewing, repeated viewing. Um, a lot of visitors are just coming to hear, you know, what I'm saying about the topics I'm interested in. Well, okay, I want to take issue with that. Okay. Because I, I don't look at a lot of YouTube videos, but I see a lot of it, and it's, it's very unpleasant to look at. Okay. And part of that is because people are uploading relatively low quality, and then it's being converted again, which I don't know if people realize that, but when you send something up to YouTube, it's being converted a second time. So it's really important that you put up the best quality you can within the limits of the requirements of YouTube. Again, if you really want to differentiate yourself, even if it just comes down to having people watch it, mm -hmm. and enjoy it, if it's worth the effort to make it, it's worth the effort to actually make it better. And this is almost, this costs you a little bit of time. You can go make yourself a peanut butter sandwich if it takes that much time. But it's worth the bother to actually to upload something of higher quality knowing that YouTube or somebody else is going to mangle it in some way that you don't have any control over. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, people are going to start getting tired of things that are difficult to look at. And while that may not stop people from producing it, um, if you don't have something that's difficult to look at, they're liable to look at it more than once. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, that is, yeah, that's a, a viable point. And I, I mean, usually it's for me just speed. I'm very impatient. Um, I usually just you know want to click export and upload it as soon as I can. Um, but I mean, if I if I was doing a project like that, I would probably be told from a professor who I've learned you know most of these things from um, that that's the way I should be doing it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you back to what this gentleman is saying here. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed that people are really hung up is not the quality of the video, so I beg to differ with them. They're more concerned with the audio. Okay. That seems to be the paramount. There's like background noise, if the uh, dialogue is not uh, distinguishable, if you're hearing the siren is going by, that turns people nearly off yeah. the video. So I noticed that's the reason why I record on CNN and it's done pretty well because the people who do have those portable devices, although the quality is not the most exceptional, um, are able to get people to watch because everything is audibly clear and undistorted. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it all depends on your application. If you're really going for a professional type of job or something, then absolutely I agree with the gentleman. Yeah. Um, but I find in my personal experience that, uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to cost, expertise, time spent on learning mm -hmm. the technology and your budget. You, don't, you, you work with what you have to so make sure the sound is definitely unquestionably, you know, clear. Okay. I mean, it's, like I said, it's usually just for time for me. Um, and that is something that I should touch on. A lot of the time, it's not comments I'm getting about the video quality, because it's you know as much as I can export. Um, but it's usually about audio quality. Um, and you know maybe that's something that I need to go back and, uh, and make sure is different when I'm exporting. Yeah. Uh, 
What is time differential? Is it twice as much time, 10 times as much time? What, what, what's the... I'm not sure I understand what you're... Well, you're, you're talking about your variation. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, usually, if I'm creating a video and it's a one-take video, um, instead of intro, uh, instead of having an intro that I edit in and having an outro I edit in, I always start my video with, "Hey everyone, it's Ben Hughes here, obviously from obviouslybenhughes.com, and today, blah blah blah." And then I end my video with, "It's Ben Hughes here, obviously." And instead of having to edit in, you know, whatever intro I need, I do it myself. Um, and that, that was something that I learned to do with the flip camera because then I could just plug it in, upload it, and it's, you know, it's fully packaged. Um, and it's got my brand on either end of it so people, you know, remember and hopefully will, you know, follow through to more videos. Um, if I'm doing a larger production, like I did a video called Focus, um, where I actually took an HD camera and attached it to a 1974 film camera and, uh, and you know, went around and rack focused on a bunch of different items. Um, that took hours, um, and it was it was mostly in editing. Well, that can require the upload time. Oh, um, usually it depends on your speed. Um, I've I've had videos upload. Um, I actually once had a video upload in literally like 15 seconds, and I don't know why. Um, but then there's other times that it can it can wait up to 40 minutes, um, even more if it's a huge. I was file. talking about the difference between the way you upload and the gentleman. I don't, I'm, I mean, I know what I do. I know what's, what's making a, 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 a How long is that peanut butter sandwich? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, compared to what? Compared to one minute? Or compared I, don't to think it's a, I don't think it's a one to two difference, but I'm not going to give you any specific numbers because he's right. He's so is it pet. less than one to two or more than one? I'd say less than one to two personally. It's not going to be twice as long. Uh -huh. I think it depends on how fast your computer is, how fast your network connection is. The server on the other end, all of those things are, are important. And and what's your what your bandwidth is in terms of time? I mean, what he's saying is perfectly valid. And what he's saying perfectly valid about sound being much more important than the video. You shouldn't skip on audio over video for sure. It comes down to what your threshold for quality is. It really comes down to what you think is important. I think you should never underestimate the fact that you care whatever it is that you care about, you should at least meet that standard. But at the same time, if it's a matter of getting it out there because it's time sensitive and that's a critical issue too in, in some circumstances, then, then do that. I know that's not an answer, but... So what you basically saying is about 50 to 75% more time? I would say so. Okay. I mean, it's, that's a guess and, and, you know, there could be a range of 30 to 50% on either side of that. Um, I'm really, my, my personal feeling is you upload the stuff, you see how long it takes, you see how you feel about it, you see how it looks. And then you say, oh, I can do better than that, and I don't mind taking the time, or gee, that's good enough, or I don't want it to be that much, I'm going to make it less. I mean, really, find out what your pain threshold is. Because it's painful. It's time consuming. This is, this is a painful experience. Well, you can run it as a background task. Oh, yeah, sure. You can walk away from your computer. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, one good rule of thumb is garbage in, garbage out. So whatever you start with is what you're going to end up with. Or worse. Yeah. Right, exactly. Like you mentioned with uh, compression versions and such. Uh, the issue about uh, uh, bit, bit rate, I think it is good to go 192 at least. I mean, 128 at least, I'd say, especially as this gentleman suggested, switching to mono. I mean, I think it's a pretty much a one-to-one -one conversion from 64 to 128. You drop from stereo, that's two mono tracks at 64 mm -hmm. or one at 128. You're much better off. I think you're more likely to forgive bad audio. I mean, I'm sorry, forgive bad video than forgive bad, bad, audio. bad audio. audio. Bad audio can hurt, you know. Yeah. Bad video doesn't hurt. Yeah, well, usually. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Get a quick mic. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Or a camera that has, um, even the low-end cameras, they have a Audio external jacks. mic uh, jack. External mic jack. A lot of people, when they get the low camera, they say, oh, it's great, it's high definition, but they don't realize that you can't plug an external mic into it. It's useless unless you're going to be using it in an environment where you can control the sound. And when you buy a camera like that, you're not buying it because you can't control the sound. You want to be portable. Dinner party, you're at park, wherever you're at, you want to use it. So. Does Android have this sort of mic? Um, not that I know of. Uh, Make sure I'm like for it. I've never. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it has a. Um, no, it has a headphone jack. <laughs> you can plug it into that. I'm you sorry? Can't, you can't plug, the you can't plug a microphone into that, yeah. no. But it does, I mean, speaking of Android X, it does have the three point mic system, so depending on where it's facing is 
and depending on where the sound is coming from, it activates different microphones. So, yeah. Some of the newer headphones, especially with the headsets with the microphone, can be used as a mic. Um, it's not the most ideal mic, but it's something external. And closer to the mouth than. Right. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to add one about the audio quality, which the gentleman spoke about. Any uh, camera that you have that you're using a built in camera, you will 100% of the time get a hiss. Yeah. If you don't want a hiss, use external. What about I mean, the workarounds for cameras that don't have enough there are external recorders that you can buy, and you can you can plug either a mic in there, or they come with microphones built in, um, and then you do have to sync them in post production. But yeah, I mean it's it's certainly possible. You see a lot of people with. Uh, relatively inexpensive still cameras that shoot video, and they're shooting video higher resolution than 20, uh, 12, like 720. Uh, but they, all they do is they get, they got a really crappy recorder built in, and, and the way in which a lot of professional videographers are going is that they're using these external devices, and they're basically using the audio on the camera as a reference point for the audio that they're collecting externally, and they're tying it together. It's a little bit more time consuming, Maybe it's too time consuming, but but it is it's a way in which you can control where you're pointing your recorder at with the with the camera, regardless of the camera, the audio you're getting is where you're pointing the lens, which isn't necessarily where you want the audio to point. Yeah. I hate to harp on it, but I'm very pleased with the case. Um I I have noticed different hums and hisses. I mean, like Jay said, if you have an onboard audio recording device, it's going to be different than anything external. And most external microphones will be higher quality than what you have built in. No, I mean, uh, certainly not something that would be noticeable to someone who's just clicking on, um, but it, you know, it certainly is possible. I've just never checked that. Yes, ma'am. Does anyone have a recommendations for an external mic? Usually, if you um, if you will go to you know whatever search engine you prefer and type in your camera and then compatible external microphone or um, rocket mic, um, there's usually if you have a high end camera and you have a what's called a hot shoe where a light would usually snap in, um, you could just you know phantom power it onto that and uh, and that should be you know suitable for it. Um, if there's no hot shoe, then hopefully your camera will have an audio jack. Um, that you can plug into, um, but you would have to search for compatible things because there are different um, different microphones that go with different cameras. For a purely external uh, audio recorder, the Zoom H4, it's like 300 bucks. It's yeah. kind of pricey, but it, the quality is absolutely great. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've had two friends who um, who have used that, and they you know they rave about it. How big is it? It's um, like it's about that big, and it has two little microphones. Yeah, they're back there. I got one. So. Sorry. Oh, no, it's fine. This is an older one. It looks like that. That's the best one. The DH4 is the dead. Is this a better one than the one you have? You don't like it though? It's an H4, Zoom H4. Is that's, it better? That, that's the best one. Really? It's better it's, than it this feels one? more solid and it's a better than which one? But this is a little newer, it's smaller. That's an H2. Yeah. Which is a good Which is still good. I just didn't need which as high of a quality as an I H4. Don't know about the, new H, the new H4 has four track capability, which is cool, but yeah. the balance. You see this right here? Yeah. Okay, this is a this is a focused microphone here. And when I point it at somebody, I'm only gonna get the sound coming straight from him. I don't get the sound from either side. So there's an advantage over that one. However, that one is less expensive, and it's good. So, and this one is not built to last. It's really scuffed up, and the new ones, at least, they feel like they'll last. I'm sorry to hear they're not any good. No, no, they're great. I didn't yeah. think that's one of the best audio recorders that I've ever seen. Yeah, it's nice. It's worthwhile. Yeah, I can pass this around as long as I promise I get it back. <laughs> Anybody want to look at it? It does look like it. <laughs> Any other? Yeah.
share. Can I have a quick video? Okay. All right, so moving on to blogging versus vlogging. Um, there are a lot of different ways that people approach making video blogs on the internet. Um, personally, I see two different types of people. Um, there are the people who start off as blogging and then move to video, and uh, we'll get into that with the next slide, and I call them video bloggers. And then there are the people who start off with video as their medium, and I call them bloggers. Um, with blogging versus blogging, you're comparing typing versus speaking. With typing um, and with speaking, you have the ability to edit what you're saying, but with typing, you have the ability to you know, go to the thesaurus while you're writing it and you know, find the perfect words that you want and everything that you want to say exactly how you want to say it. Um, a lot of the times, if you want to um, say exactly what you want to say, you might have to have a script prepared um, while you're making your video, or you might you know, need to look things up beforehand and make sure that either the topic that you're talking about is factually correct, or that you're saying um, things in exactly the way that you want the audience to hear them. Um, and that could go, you know, into political, you know, videos that are put out or propaganda videos and, you know, influencing people by the way that you say things. Um, that's not what I'm really going for. Um, but there is a difference and, uh, and something that is, uh, there's something to be said for getting acquainted with the medium of video um, compared to, you know, writing on your blog where you have the ability to freely edit everything that you're saying. Um, there's also the thing that I call it, um, and a lot of people call it it. Um, if you've ever seen American Idol and someone walks out on stage or into the audition room and they just bust that high note and they really hit it and they've got a stage presence and you know that they're going to be a star, that's the it factor. Um, there's a lot of people who start off as video creators and I know that I was one of them. Um, and they start off and they might not necessarily have the it factor. They might be, you know, sitting in their room talking about how their day at work stunk or, you know, talking about how their bike broke or something like that. Um, and not a lot of people are going to want to watch that. But if you say, you know, oh, I had, you know, I was pouring coffee at work today and a hot, a hot pot broke and all the coffee spilled over me and maybe you reenact it or maybe, you know, add some more spice or another uh, cut to clip about you know the, the scar that you have on your hand or the giant bubble or whatever, um, that is going to be more intriguing than what you're going to be showing people with just sitting and being like, well, my hand really hurts and you know I spilled hot coffee on it. It really stinks. It's it's all about you know engaging your audience and making sure that they're seeing something that they want to return to or view more of your videos. Um, red light personality is something that has actually been studied and been deemed some sort of phenomena. Um, I don't know if it's classified as like an actual, you know, mental thing, but there's um, there's a theory that when people, especially it comes from news anchors with the red light, um, when news anchors would be sitting at the desk and you know they're chatting to their coworker and they're shuffling their papers <coughs> and getting ready, bless you. Um, yeah, bless you, just in case. Um, if they're you know sitting at the desk and they're chatting with their coworkers, um, or you know they're talking to the camera guy, and uh, and as soon as that red light goes on, they have their personality and they're delivering their news as you want to hear it. That's called red light personality, and that's something that it may take time for you when you're starting off in video to develop. That's something that I definitely had to work on, and it's not something that you know um, you might be born with it, you might not. Um, and you can definitely you know learn how to speak and how to engage your audience with your tone of voice. Um, that's something that when you're writing, you also obviously have a tone of voice, um, depending on the words that you choose, the way that you phrase things, um, also including you know pictures or quotes or whatever you might want um, in with your article. Um, but when you don't have you know, the, the type to you know, hide behind or edit, um, you really need to have that on-screen personality that you know, otherwise people are going to watch your videos and be like, well, hmm, he's talking about how he burned his hand. He's not really you know, jiving with me. So it's, it's something that definitely can be worked on, but if you have it, you will definitely know that you have it because you'll get comments from people saying, Oh my God, you're you're so intriguing. I want to watch you again, or you know, I've I've subscribed to your videos here on YouTube. I definitely want to see exactly what you have to say for the rest of my life. Hopefully. Um, so the other aspect of blogging versus vlogging is the two types of video creators, like I told you earlier. Um, there's the video bloggers, who I classify as people who are just making videos to either sell you their product 
or to um, to increase their SEO because it's just one more way that they can include their name somewhere on the internet for Google to pick up. Um, and then there's the people who are the bloggers. And uh, and I consider a lot of the people that I know, um, I consider a lot of them video bloggers because they do have you know a, a product that they want to sell or something you know that they the end game is to get you to buy a shirt or the end game is to you know buy my song on iTunes after you watch this video. Um, the bloggers are the people who take the time to sit down at the end of the day. Um, they might post their video in the morning. At the end of the day, they come home and it might you know have a thousand views and have. 50 comments. They will literally go through every comment. I try to do this as often as possible, um, and especially if you're using YouTube, you get you can get all of your comments directly in your email inbox, um, which makes it really easy to file and organize by video and you know by um, the date that it was commented on. Um, but there are people who will go through and reply to every single comment. Um, I try to do this as much as I can. Um, I haven't been able to lately because it has been picking up a little bit. Um, but back when I, um, maybe about three months ago, was still replying to every single comment, the top compliment that I would be receiving was, wow, a lot of, you know, a lot of the other people on this site you know, just get comments and they just disregard them. I don't even know if they read them. But you know, I, I really like that you're you know, taking the time to, out of your day to come back and talk with us about this topic. You could just post this video and be on your merry way. And if you, you know, have ads next to it, you could be making money but just not care about the video anymore because you're making your next one. If the audience is seeing that you're actively engaging them, just like on your blog, if you go into the comment section and reply to people and start a conversation with them, they're more likely to come back because they know that that's someone that they can talk to, that's someone that they can put stock in. Um, the vloggers are the ones that have the real life relatable content. They might be um, shooting a video every single day. There's many people um, online who shoot a video every single day of their life and then they upload that video the next day. Um, they might get a million views, they might get 100,000, they might get 12. Um, but as long as they're uploading real, relatable content and not something like buy my ebook or download my new song, it's something that people are going to be willing to come back over and over and over again to interact with. Um, now, audience quality or quantity. Um, there's two kinds of interaction that I see. Direct, which is what I just told you about with comments. Um, you're literally talking to the person on the other side of that camera. When you're sitting at your computer screen and you see the other people who are you know, talking to you and conversing with you, you're literally getting their opinions in the comments and you're talking to them about, you know, um, you know, I hate abortion. And then they'll comment and say, well, I don't hate abortion, I think it's really good. And you'll comment back and say, you know, hopefully you'll be an adult about it, and you'll comment back and say, you know, this is the reason that I have these views, I hope that you can understand this, let's start a debate, let's start a discussion. Usually that doesn't end very well and will lead to haters, but hopefully um, if everyone in the conversation is being an adult, it can lead to some really, really eye-opening um, discussions. And I actually interacted with a guy um, about gun control um, about a year ago on a video that he posted. And I posted a comment and I was like, I don't understand this. This is like, I was being completely honest. And I said, I don't know where you're coming from. Um, you know, I think, you know, these are my views. This is what I believe. And, uh, and he wrote back and he was actually being an adult about it. In his video, he was screaming his head off. He was, you know, he was being really mad about, you know, these gun control policies. And, uh, and he wrote back to me as a level-headed individual. And seeing that, I was able to engage with him and create a conversation that literally lasted three days. I would go on and you know check the comments and be like, oh, he replied back to me. Now I've got to reply to him. And you know, we eventually um, changed each other a little bit and changed each other's viewpoint. Um, I now think differently about gun control, and I think that he possibly does too. But he was really angry when he made this video, so maybe not. Um, the other way that there is an interaction is indirect. If someone sees your video but they don't comment, um, or someone sees your name and they subscribe to you on YouTube where they go to your site and bookmark it, um, if they see that but they don't leave a comment for you or they don't you know, interact with you, it's kind of an interaction because they're getting your side of it, but there's no two-way street. And going back to replying to every comment, if people see that you're in the comments and you know in the trenches with them talking about the issue and making sure that you know whatever it is that you're talking about is understood, um, people will be more likely to comment. And one of the things that I like personally about YouTube, being the platform that I use most often, um, is that when an uploader comments on their own video, it highlights that comment in yellow. 
So when someone scrolls down to the comments below the video, they can see, oh gosh, you know, there's, you know, someone commented or apply, someone commented or apply, another apply from the person who originally commented. If they see that interaction, they're going to be more likely to put their two cents in. And uh, there actually is a video that I uploaded maybe two weeks ago, um, and it got over 170,000 views in about seven days, which was kind of crazy because I've never had that happen before. But the reason that it kept spreading was because people kept coming back to be in the discussion, and it just so happened to be about Tila Tequila getting beat up or something um, by, by these crazy mob people. Um, but they came back because in the comments I said, tell me what you think of Tila Tequila. And they commented, and they would come back and say, oh my gosh, all these other people you know, don't agree with me. I need to you know, put up for my side. I need to you know, make sure that people understand why I don't like her or whatever they might think. Um, and then you know, two days later, I would comment and say, what do you think of the people that beat her up? And they would come back and say, oh, you know, you shouldn't beat up a girl, or you know, she had it coming, or whatever they would say. Um, and I'm not saying either side is right. But when they see that you're in the comments actively engaging them, they're going to come back. They're more than willing to take five minutes out of their day and hopefully write a normal level-headed comment and not something in all caps with no spelling in grammar. Investing time. This is something that a lot of people neglect <laughs> over, um, over the, um, the course of when they're making videos. Um, when you have an audience that's watching your videos, even if it's five people on every single video, you need to nurture that audience because that audience has friends and has family and has people who are willing to, you know, uh, look at that video. If someone said, hey, have you seen that Laughing Baby video? Oh no, I haven't. Can you show it to me? I love Laughing Babies. They're cute. That's how your video gets shared. That's how videos go viral. If you make something that people are willing to share, you're going to have, hopefully, a hit on your hands. Um, so you need to nurture your audience. One of the biggest ways is um, to interact without ulterior motives. And like I said, there's the video bloggers and then there's the bloggers. The video bloggers are the ones who have something to sell and they're probably just engaging you to get something out of you. Not that that's wrong, not that there's you know, anything wrong with that. There's many people who make their livings doing that and you know, it's, it's the way that they roll. But if they know that you're being true to um, their ideas of what you're presenting to them, if you're being true to your own ideals, then they're more willing to interact with you and instead of just subscribing on YouTube or just going to your website and bookmarking it, they'll go follow you on Twitter or they'll shoot you an email and say, hey, this is what I think of your video or they'll you know, post a comment on your blog or on your YouTube profile or whatever. Um, and then replying to everyone as equals. Like I said, if you keep a level head, if you um, look at everyone's viewpoint and say, you know what, you're a Republican and I'm a Democrat, or you're a Libertarian and I'm, you know, whatever the opposite of that is, um, you, if you keep a level head and reply to those people as if they're your equal and you might have differing viewpoints but you're still human, they're more willing to act like that in return. That has high yields. That has a proven, um, a proven way of getting people to come back to your content repeatedly over and over, um, especially if they're going to bookmark you or subscribe to you. Marketing your content. Um, this is another thing that a lot of people do very well, but then some people tend to overlook that. Um, don't just post your video in one place. If you post it on YouTube, take that link, put it on Twitter. Say, I just uploaded a new video. There's a really great tool on YouTube called AutoShare. You can auto share you know, everything down to every single video you comment on with a little synopsis of that comment, or you can only auto share when you upload a video. That's what I have set up. So anytime I upload a video, it automatically posts to Twitter, it automatically posts to my website, and it automatically, automatically posts to both my Facebook profile and my Facebook fan page. It's a really, really awesome tool, and usually if you can't do it through the website that you're uploading to itself, there's other places and sites that we use, you know, an RSS feed that updates every half an hour to automatically post that link to wherever you may want it to go. Um, like I said, spread using available tools. Use the things that you have that are given to you completely for free. If you sign up for a YouTube account and you go, you know, I, I really want to auto share, you don't have to pay for that. It's, it's something that is completely built in and they want you to do that because that gets more people coming to their site and more ad revenue for them. Utilize your friends, oh yeah, sorry. Okay, well, it's right there, I can remember. Oh, I might forget. Uh, question in reference to uh, posting 
various sites, mm -hmm. especially the video. Mm -hmm. What you're doing is you're cross posting and cross platforms that are very popular, like you know, Facebook and YouTube and mm -hmm. Twitter. But what about posting on different video websites? Like There's tools that can do that. Um, there are sites like uh, the one that comes to mind that I've used before is called Tube Mogul. Um, T U B E M O G U L. Um, and that can, I think, now can cross post to over 20 different sites, um, including Vimeo, Midler, um, you know, Rever, YouTube, Blip, Daily Motion Break. Because it makes sense to do that when you're, you're sort of like, isn't it better to get the bigger fish as versus getting all the fish? I mean, there are different audiences for different sites. Um, YouTube is seemingly the biggest, well, it is the biggest video website, but it's the most widespread across the world. Whereas Dailymotion, you might go to for people in Europe, or you might go to Break for a certain demographic. So, I mean, you if you nurture your um, the group that you really want to target the most, then you will have, you know, obviously more viewership on there, but there's nothing wrong with posting around to a whole bunch of different websites. Um, and if, if someone sees it on break and they don't see it on YouTube, but they still like it, they're probably going to post the break link. Um, and if you have you know, ad revenue or whatever enable on there, that could turn any money. I got blown off with uh, two mobile. Uh, I objected to the fact that I was going to be marketing. Okay. And there are, it's not just Tube Mobile, there are other sites that you can use that you may be Traffic Geyser is another place you can go to if you want to distribute. Traffic Geyser? Yeah. Okay. That's, you have to pay for that. Yeah. He's making a very interesting point now that he's saying that because a lot of these other sites too, if, you know, right now you can have 700 videos, have a half a million viewers, mm -hmm. also some, someone knocks on your door and says, we want to basically syndicate, we want to buy your social property. Mm -hmm. YouTube owns your videos and you post them on there. So you would have to start from scratch. You does not own your videos. No, you own, you own the they, copyright too. Once, once they're loaded, once they're uploaded onto YouTube, that quote unquote they can decide to keep them and essentially meaning owning them. Yeah, you own them in the sense that you can go and post them on other sites, and, and YouTube is not going to send you a cease and assist order. At the same time, if you started making money or something and said, "Hey, I'm going to use these videos exclusively," because I'm showing sure condition of YouTube that says. You're not allowed, like, we all do, we want to pursue uh, Someone who would be good to answer that is Jay, who's right behind you. He is a YouTube partner and has been uploading videos, which are way more seen than I am. Um, but he would know a lot of that, and he's shaking his head. As far as I know, um, the videos are your intellectual property. When you create something and upload it to YouTube, um, they, the reason that is, is because if you upload porn to YouTube, it's your fault. It's not YouTube's fault, because they can't control what you upload. Um, so it's your intellectual property, um, and you're free to do with that whatever you want to. You can post it to you know any site that you may want. Um, I've never heard of anyone getting in trouble with YouTube or any video sharing site um, I, I because they cross post it. He's not saying you get in trouble. What he's saying is basically half the split. You have your copy, and YouTube has their copy. And if you wanted to do something completely exclusive, YouTube could still exactly. run a, a dual promotion using the exact same a non exclusive exactly. perpetual license. Yeah, yeah. But that, that's, that's, the, that's the, their product that they offer. Right, that's exactly what I said. That's what they, they get out of being able to host it for free. They wouldn't you know, sue you because you're trying to sell your own videos because there's still your intellectual property. Yeah, I mean, they would need your permission to cross post that. They would, they would absolutely need to ask for permission before cross posting anywhere. I think if you check the box off, you are agreeing to that. Right, and it's not that they'll cross post it elsewhere, it's just that they don't have to take it down. So I mean, if you decide to start selling your video somewhere else, you have already granted them a worldwide non exclusive license perpetually to keep showing your content. But so you can't make it exclusive, but no, that's no, fine. Yeah. You can also I mean, show it somewhere can, else. But you can go on YouTube and delete your video. They probably will still have a copy somewhere on their server. Um, and if you know, if 
they want to do with that what they want to, you probably have the right to go and sue them, or you know, in pr at least go after that a little bit farther than you know the normal person would. Um, I honestly have not read the entire terms and conditions. Um, I've just read you know whenever it's implied uh, applied to me. Um, but if you wanted to, I could go through that. No, and no, see. no, that's cool. That's cool. I just I just know that there's certain, web, for example, Blip TV mm -hmm. is they're known to not own your stuff. They have no interest in what's mm -hmm. So if you don't knock on your door and want to syndicate and give you a reality show, Blip says that's your stuff. Mm -hmm. You made our money. You made your money. We're all happy. But I've I've read and, and heard of individuals that don't have that exclusivity when they post on uh, different websites. Okay. I mean. It's you're really, making videos for fun. Yeah. You're not out to like, you know, go ahead and get a reality show tomorrow, are you? Not really. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're busy with college. <laughs> All right. Um, I, but, I think it's yeah. important to bear in mind that if you're creating something that you want to sell, then you have a responsibility to think about, you know, who has a, their hands on it. And if, if you're going to, if you're going to put it on a site that has the freedom to be able to replicate it because that's how it functions, then you're losing control of your media. So, so that's the risk that you take. Whatever type of complications result, and obviously you could sue anybody, providing you have enough money. So there's there's the same thing that the YouTube has. That who's going to sue them? You know, somebody with a lot of money. Well, then they'll pay attention. But the average person, no. But I, I think that if money is an issue, and if you want exclusivity, you have to look very closely at how you're presenting and 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 distributing the media. The problem with that is it's the internet. Anything that's true. Yeah. And as soon as you that's post something true, on YouTube, there are sites that will automatically copy that video. Yeah, you can download um, YouTube videos. Like yeah. even before they allow, I think they now embed an MP4 link that you can actually download from YouTube. But before you can just get FLV rivers, that you can, the, the the means are out there. Yeah, and there's also there's also websites, very high profile websites that recently have come into question, um, namely being Spike which would take high viewed videos, highly viewed videos, and directly download them and upload them right back onto their website without any credit, without any you know, hot linking back to, um, to the original content creator. And that is highly wrong. Yeah. Um, we're running ads on, that, on those two. On yours. Yeah, yeah. You, can, you can embed videos from YouTube onto your website. Yeah. And you absolutely. Can it. Yeah. I mean, it's up to the creator of the video. Well, I mean, if you, when you upload, it also says that you do own all intellectual property that you upload. Um, like I said, if you upload porn, it's your fault. It's not, it's not YouTube. Um, so if you were to upload something and then um, it gets cross-posted somewhere, it does show that the earliest upload of that was on YouTube and or you know wherever you may have posted it and there's um, there's information embedded in the file when it's uploaded that will say exactly when it was put online. I want to follow up. Okay. Now that we're talking about money. Um, are you able to monetize what you're doing? Are you like I know YouTube has a partnership program. Yes. Not everybody can get in nope. me, but I know that there are people like Shane Dawson, mm -hmm. S and G, and all these guys who are delivering. 500,000, million views, 5 million views, 20 million views in, in the span of a month. Mm -hmm. And if you look at their demos, those are demos that advertisers would love to get. Yeah, absolutely. And they are also content creators that mm, traditional media is very afraid of. They're making um, money because their yes. stuff is, is running with ads underneath it. Very so they're suddenly making a nice piece of change. So they may not have copyright, but they're making real money. Yeah, I mean, I personally. Um, Fred, Fred just got himself a copy of the television series. So, I mean, there's a trade off between. Well, he has a movie coming out. I don't know about the. Control is another payoff that, you know, you know, when, you, when you start filming 20 million views, you're in a different ballpark as far as YouTube is concerned. Yeah, and also you got to bear in mind that everything that, you know, the quantity that's put out there makes really most of what is distributed sized in terms of. You know, it's a, you you can't put an awful lot of value on your own product. It's unfortunate. The, the value is you're the product. You're the product. Your ability to be able to create this content, their ability, the, the gentleman, uh, the people you're talking about, their 
their product is themselves. They're really produced more of that time. What they've already produced, maybe they have to give up on it. Maybe, maybe it's not important to the people that want to use them. You know what I'm saying? They can't. They could possibly reuse it, but maybe not. So I think if you have too tight a grip on your media, it, it, it just doesn't work that way anymore. You just can't, I don't believe, you can count on, on, on having that kind of exclusivity that you used to have when everything was printed on paper, and that was the best thing going. Yeah. Or people, three networks control the earth. I'm getting told that we have very little time, but what was your question? When you were talking about uh, Spike not giving you credit, like you, when you own video example, is they cut off the beginning and an end giving you credit? You know how you were talking about the if, Well, it hasn't personally happened to me, but... No, no, if, I understand, but... I'm yeah, but if my video was taken and put on Spike and no credit was given to me, it would no, still have... No, but if they cut off the beginning and the end where you given... They may, credit. I'm I'm not sure on specifics of any of the videos that they may have ripped off. So. Yeah, it, was, it usually was full as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So then you get your own credit by saying it's the beginning Yeah, I'm, I'm... It's coming. <laughs> um, so, platforms, <laughs> um, self-hosting. A lot of people want to self-host because they want to have a file that is uh, automatically linked in iTunes, or they might want to have you know, their viewers come and they don't really care about bandwidth, and you, know, you can download the full quality video and, uh, and get every single you know, pixel and everything, but there are cons to that. It does take a lot of bandwidth, and it could get very expensive especially if you don't have an elastic sort of hosting program, um, because if your program blows up and if your video is getting downloaded millions of times in a month, when usually it's downloaded you know, dozens, um, then you would definitely need to have elastic hosting, um, and if you don't, you could get major overage charges. Um, and yeah, they become expensive. But um, with video sharing sites, there are uh, obviously still pros and cons. Um, the large audience already exists. There's, like I said, billions of views on YouTube every single day. Um, it's easy to find a niche because there's so many people but they all have their own little thing that they're doing. Someone might be doing what you're doing. Someone might want to make tuna fish sandwiches and uh, and you know they have just as much as a passion as you do but you might deliver it completely differently and uh, you know you might do it outside or only when it's raining or you know there is that specific niche that you can fit into. Those are just dumb examples obviously. Um, and then usually they are free. There are certain sites that will require um, you to pay you know, a hosting fee if you go over a certain amount of views or if you want to upload a certain, um, a certain file size or you know, larger than a certain length that they might allow. Um, the cons to that is that you have limited control on the viewing experience, and we talked about this earlier, that when you self-host, um, you have the ability to put that video on whatever web page that you want of yours. When you put it onto an actual video sharing site, you're going to um, have their logo probably in the bottom left or right hand corner. Um, you're probably going to have their logo up at the top of that page, and people are going to have to go to their website when they want to watch your content. That, for some people, that gets really, you know, they don't like that, and, uh, and they want to have you know, just their brand and just their product that they're selling or you know, their face next to their videos. Um, and upload limits is another big con to, um, to video sharing sites. YouTube recently went from what they've always had, um, well, they used to have unlimited um, file, or unlimited time lengths, then they went to a 10 minute time length, and 10 minute limit of a time length, and then they went to 15 minutes. Um, now you can do 15 minutes, you can do over two gigabyte uploads on YouTube. Um, there's other sites that, like I said, you might have to pay if you, um, you want to have a larger file size or you want to have it distributed to more than a certain number of viewers. And then WordPress integration, which we're all here for. Um, there's plugins, which we've talked about, uh, myself and Kurt and Amanda, who's doing the other session next door, we talked about that, and it's usually the least effective because you don't get those views and statistical data from the people who are viewing your video. Um, when you have embedded videos, like you take the YouTube embed code and just change it to whatever size you might want, um, you still get that view, you still get the, um, the trackback links when people are visiting your site, and, uh, and on YouTube, with the Insight um, built-in analytics program that they have on YouTube, um, you can go into Insight and see, oh, someone you know, viewed this 140 times, it's been viewed on my, uh, on my website, Whereas you know on YouTube it's only been viewed maybe 80 times or you know 140,000 times, 
and uh, Video Press, which I want to show you the website for because it is really exciting. Um, and it's from WordPress. Um, let me just resize this because it might not fit. Let's go over here. So, Video Press was recently released, and I'm going to show you. Um, that's resized. I'm going to go to the homepage. Um, it's a really, really cool, seamlessly integrated product that you can have on your WordPress site. Um, and it allows you to, I don't know if that's going to autoplay. Oh, no, it's not. That's nice. Um, but you can see here, it allows you to have HD video. It allows you, because it is an open source platform, to develop off of their product and put onto your site, you know, maybe a more enhanced version of that. Um, it, oh, more features. It um, is expandable depending on your layout. So when you embed it, it might, you know, if you only have 300 pixels to fit it in, it might go to only 300 or 500 or 1700, whatever you're viewing at. Um, and it publishes right up to your server, um, wherever that might be, whether it's most likely hosted on your own server for video press. Actually, uh, video press only works with WordPress. Uh, it's two part statement. It only works with video, uh, WordPress.com. Yeah. You have to have a WordPress.com and not the .org. Yeah. And then you can like embed videos in your .org, which I mean, I think there's like a widget that you can, like there's a plugin or whatever that you can grab them more seamlessly. But there's, it, it's not really for, it's not seamless for .org. Okay. It's 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 right. a, a money making. It's by automatic. You know. It's, yeah. It's not the open source. It's one of their products. Right. Obviously. Exactly. Which yeah. is cool because it's done so much cool stuff. Um, but I'm interested in finding like a plugin. Like, I know there's the JW player, I know there's like mm -hmm. the Flow player, and there's like a ton of Flash based players, but like nobody built a actual WordPress video plug. And that's like the closest yeah. thing, but it's still like from them. far off. Yeah. I mean, I personally, um, I hadn't had time to go in and play with any sort of installation because I don't have a testing ground for that. Um, but I mean, if you Google it, there are so many things, like you said, JW player or I've been doing things. like six months of research on it. Yeah, and it's, it's not it's not easy. It's there's, there's no there's no solution. Yeah, and there's no main place that you can go to find. You know, you can go to the directory of plugins, but there's no you know rating system that is so clearly defined that says you know this is what it doesn't do. This is exactly what it needs to be doing. Um, and nowhere that you know a developer as of yet can go and say you know these are the problems that are you know being encountered by other people. This is what we need to build. Um, and I think once someone builds that, um, or once you know automatic builds some sort of upgrade to video press, it could be a phenomenal solution. So. Do you have any tips about how somebody could set up a YouTube embed um, on WordPress.org? I honestly have not used WordPress.org. Um, I've used the .com, but not .org. Uh, I would imagine it would be the exact same thing, but it would be using uh, it would be using the embed code that YouTube actually gives you and putting it into, instead of doing, instead of, when you go to, when you go to, One is one that you um, have hosted on WordPress, and you have, you know, whatever dot WordPress dot com, um, and you can have your domain forwarded to that. Um, the other one is hosted on your own server, um, and you're responsible for updating that and responsible for making sure that all of your files are where they need to be. And that one is which one you just mentioned, the latter one, that's the dot com or the org. That's org. Okay. No, that was dot WordPress is dot com. Self-hosted. Video video press only works with WordPress.com. We were talking about um, what's the difference between .org and .com. Right, but yes. What's this the is the last question. Just just to just let you know, we have to cut this good. off because it's nine o'clock. Okay. And Microsoft is really strict about trying to get us out. So, okay. I'm um, told that we need to stop. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry. Right. If, if you want, I can I can talk to you about the embed link. Um, after this, so. Yeah. All right. Yay. Shameless self-promotion. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much. That was great.